everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dan Height, and this is Flies in the Kitchen. Well, it's been a little while, and I appreciate your patience. This is a one-man operation, as you know, and life will sometimes get in the way. However, I am excited to be bringing some great conversations your way pretty soon, starting with this one. If you've listened to the podcast before, you've noticed that all three of my previous guests have been songwriters. Well, I'm switching it up a little bit today and sitting down with an author, Hanif Abdurraqib. He's the author of a book of poems called The Crown Ain't Worth Much, uh, also essays in various publications such as The New Yorker and other anthologies. His book Vintage Sadness had a limited publication of 500 copies, which sold out almost immediately. And he has a brand new book of essays coming out this winter called They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us. Hanif grew up in Columbus, and we talk a lot about his home, growing up in a, in a neighborhood within a stone's throw of a much more affluent neighborhood, his hopes for his hometown, and how gentrification is pushing the marginalized further and further into the background. I'd share one of his poems with you, but as you will hear, there's value to hearing it right from Hanif's mouth. I certainly can't do them justice. One last thing. Hanif is an active proponent for social justice. You'll hear it in his poetry and his in his essays, but you'll also see it in what he does uh, here in Columbus and, and all over the country. This episode was recorded at the end of July, long before the recent violent protests organized by white supremacists, neo-Nazis, and the KKK in Charlottesville, Virginia. So you won't hear about that in this conversation. And really, my hope for this podcast has always been to be exclusively for conversations with creators about their art, their process, and most importantly, their story. Now, their story may very well include elements uh, of things like this, and that's completely fine, and it's a good place to talk about that. But if you want to hear political commentary, there are a lot of podcasts that can accommodate you. If you want to hear stories about real people and their lives and their art and how life has shaped them, feel free to hang out here. That's not to say that issues like what happened in Charlottesville aren't important. They most definitely are. And the passion and the purpose of all those that were there counter-protesting the hate and the vitriol spewing from the mouths of of torch-wheeling lunatics is as important and as critical as it has ever been. And and so since we're here, and since I brought it up, I'd like to encourage you to check out another podcast, a series called Seeing White, on a podcast called Seen on Radio. It's S-C-E-N-E on radio. It's hosted by John Biwin and Chenjirai Kumanika, and it explores in profound detail the history, science, social structure, and the development of whiteness in America how from the very beginning there was a push to ensure dominance of the white race in the building and continued development of this country. It's a kind of a dirty history, but it's real, and it's an objective and mind-blowing look at race in the United States. It's put out by the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University, and I cannot recommend it enough. If any of you follow me on Twitter, you will notice I can't stop talking about it. Flies in the Kitchen is sponsored by no one, just me. So this is a free plug. Make sure and include Seen on Radio on your list of podcasts that you listen to. And be sure and start at the very beginning of the Seen, uh, Seeing White series. Okay, let's jump right into my conversation with Hanif Abdurraki. So, uh, welcome back. Thanks. You've been yeah. your way for a couple of years? About two and a half years. Yeah, I, w- I left in August of 2014, uh, and I moved back April 
2017. And where did you go? I went to New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and I was there for a bit, and it was fine. But it's it's good to be home. Yeah, you know, it's where- like it's a little. Um, it, it's a different city than it was when I left, so it takes some re-getting used to. But I also was here so much when I was there. I traveled back and forth mm. and kind of split time. So What were you doing out there? Um, so I was there um, working with some poets and, like, writing a lot. And, you know, kind of that's where a lot of the stuff in my quote-unquote career kind of took off with mm-hmm. with writing. I think in part because I was so close in proximity in New York. Oh, nice. So you had a lot of opportunities pop up for you. Yeah. Well, you were published uh, in The New Yorker then, right? Uh, Yeah, actually this past week uh, was the first time in The New Yorker. Yeah. That was a, uh, it was, it was an essay, right? It was a, yeah, an essay about um, uh, soccer. Oh, right. um, Yeah. And about leaving Columbus, about the year I left Columbus, which Mm -hmm. was the the year of the last World Cup. Um, So it was kind of about that whole thing about, Mm -hmm. you know, leaving and coming home in, in soccer through a lens of friendship. So you've got a crew jersey on right now. I so do. You're, you're yeah. a, I'm a you, big soccer guy. You are. Yeah. I played soccer growing up. Um, I played soccer in college for a uh-huh. bit. And um, yeah, I'm a big crew fan. I was, you know, I've been a crew fan since the beginning. Um, you know, when they made it, when they came to the city, I was uh, still young. I was like maybe 13 or 14. Mm. Um, so I've been there since the beginning. And, uh, you know, I'm often uh, like a lot of crew fans, I'm, I'm often disappointed, but when they're when they're not disappointing, they're really great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you uh, you grew up here in oh, yeah. Columbus. Uh, I mean, you've got a lot of a lot of your writing takes place in Columbus, yeah. which is kind of neat to read. Um, what was your relationship with this town growing up? Oh, it was great. Although I, I think um, you know, when you're young, it's easy to imagine where you're living is like everywhere USA. Mm-hmm. You know, even I mean, I grew up on the east side of Columbus. Um, largely black community, um, varying income levels, but but mostly in between um, middle class and, and poor people. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, you know, I was very much um, invested in the kind of community that that built. You know, I, so many of my friends lived on my street. Um, we kind of had our radius that it felt like we owned. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and that kind of made um, growing up and going outward a little more fascinating for me as someone who I went to high school on the north side of Columbus. Oh. And, um, you know, I went to, to a capital university, which is right there in Bexley. But um, it made that branching out a bit odd because, uh-huh. you know, and it, it makes going back a bit odd because so many things on the east side where I grew up are, are different now. Yeah. Um, and so there are things that are not like they once were. Hmm. So I was going to ask you about that since since coming back three years later. Yeah. I mean, and, and even from your childhood, you've probably noticed it even more oh, yeah. from being away for a while. What uh, um, what kind of things have have changed for you? The uh, the short north is so different. Um, mm. and I say that now as a short north resident, official short north resident. Oh, yeah. Which has its drawbacks. Um, but also, like I didn't have so. And moving back, I didn't have a wide range of time to find an apartment. I had like four hours. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I had to like set up all these apartment appointments and I had to like run to them all within that four hour time. And at the end of that four hours, I had to just give someone money because I was going back to Connecticut that day. Oh, Um, wow. And I had no, it's hard to like find an apartment from afar. So it was just like, you know, here's a place with that I can live, take my money kind of thing. Um, but, I, you know, I lived in – I spent a lot of my, my, like, early 20s, in my 20s in Victorian Village. And um, at that point, the Short North was a real genuine hub for kind of interesting artistic movements. You know, uh, 83 Gallery especially, I feel like I have to point to shout oh. out because, you know, Gallery Hop was what it was. But at the end of the night at Gallery Hop, everyone would kind of just run to 83 Gallery and pack in there and see some kind of weird – you know, weird house show kind of vibe mm. uh, and see weird art on the wall and see your weird friends. Yeah. Um, and that was to me the last thing that really pulled the short North um, into this kind of vacuum that felt like it was yours and yours alone. Um, and now it's kind of not that at all. Now it's it, yeah. it, it, it's something like 83 gallery popped up in the short North. Now, like the, the suburban folk would be afraid <laughs> um, the suburban folk who like come in to get a taste of the city life or whatever. Uh-huh. Um, 
so that's that's a vast difference. Huh. Um, you know, the east side changes all the time. I feel like Bexley is stretching further and further into the mm. uh, areas where there are marginalized people living and trying to get by, and that's right. a bit of a bummer, of right. course. Um, but there are still, I, want, I do want to say there are still pockets of the city that are just, you know, really great things happening. I still really love, um, you know, the King Lincoln District, and, mm. and I, st- I think you have to, at least for me, um, the work to find the art you love is a little bit harder, but that makes the finding of it mm. more worthwhile. Yeah. Since moving here, we've taken a lot toward so much of the art that we've found in yeah. the town. I mean, we, we love the arts festival when it's, when it's going on and, um, it's really cool. I love seeing the community come together yeah. for things like that. The arts festival is great. Uh, this year was also great. It was very hot. So yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, I was, I was there for a few hours before I had to tap out, but, yeah. um, you know, Columbus festival season is a bit, um, overwhelming yes. and not always fruitful, but I think the arts festival is still, you know, a really good space. Right. Um, right. so, uh, when did you start taking to writing? Was that when you were a kid or when you kind of, yeah, I mean, I started writing when I was a kid, though, not very, not in a way that I thought would be anything, you know, my mm-hmm. mother was a writer, so I saw my mother writing in, um, would just write things Mm -hmm. not poems at all Mm -hmm. um just kind of write ideas down Mm -hmm. i I didn't really take the poems until um you know 2010 or 2011 oh yeah so very late in the process but because i took to it so late i did really take to it i mean i spent you know time studying poets i liked and learning how to write poems that you know were in my own voice and like really honing myself and really focusing on the craft because i knew that because i took to it so late um, I was behind. I would be behind mm-hmm. the, the kind of curve of my peers. Um, it, before that, I was writing music journalism. I was doing freelance music journalism, um, and I got kind of bored with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, now I'm no longer bored with that because that's kind of what I do. But mm-hmm. um, I got bored with it, and I got bored with, with the restrictions on it, and I thought poetry was kind of like a next, like a natural outlet for me from some of my ideas and some of my tendencies with imagery and, and kind of like conversational narrative. So I want to talk about that voice in a minute, but sure. I, I, when you when you said something about your mom, it reminded me of your uh, your book dedication, which oh, I thought yeah. was really pointed. It was uh, for the mother who raised me, and for the city that raised me when she no longer could. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about your mom. Yeah. So my mom passed away when I was thirteen, the summer uh, mm. summer of ninety seven, and um, I think that for me. I, um, you know, I was very, we were very close. I think, um, I'm the youngest of four and she kind of, you know, was, I think that all of my siblings would say that they were very close to her, you know, I mean, Mm. just naturally. Um, but I was, you know, I was the youngest and, um, I think my brother and I probably caused her, my brother who's closest to me in age probably caused her the most headaches in a lot of ways. Um, because we just were up to, terrible ideas all the time (laughs) but that what came with that was also a kind of nurturing that you know and i think um i I was deeply close to my mother and really um enjoyed um not just how close she was to me but her presence in the in the world in the city you know Mm. she would um be the type of person who remembered cashiers names so we would go to the same grocery store every two weeks and she would talk to the cashiers about their lives and she was kind of this person who would walk into a room and and um people would gravitate towards her she had a very big laugh um she had a really sharp memory mm. you know she would remember every detail of a person's life which you know uh of course was really valuable to to the way she moved in the world and so i really try um to take parts of that with me, you Mm -hmm. know, um, and model a life after that. Um, but yeah. And I, and I think after she passed away, it was really difficult for me because I didn't have a good way to connect with the world. I had, Mm -hmm. I had been, I'd seen the way she moved through the world so well Mm -hmm. and seen the way people responded to her through that lens. Um, and when I lost that blueprint, I kind of briefly lost a way that I could healthily interact with the world around me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it took a while to regain that. And, and in some ways, of course, I still am and will always be. Right. That's very sweet. She sounded, sounds like a pretty great woman. Yeah. 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 And that's, I love that you have 
so many clear images of her still that oh, uh, things about what she was for you. Um, so what, what, what's your routine look like when it comes to, I guess, when an inspiration hits you, is it something that's like all of a sudden you just got to sit and bust it all out or things happen over time or. I think for, when I'm at, I think the best writing for me kind of happens in phases. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think like a lot of poets, I probably have the days where inspiration hits and there's something I have to get down and I'm able mm-hmm. to get it down all at once. And mm-hmm. it, it is, you know, the editing process happens through the thinking through the idea. Um, but I've become better at writing in phases and writing out, um, you know, and I think of writing a poem like writing a song, like finding a place for everything, mm-hmm. um, which I, I think, especially if you're right, if you're a multi instrumentalist or if you're conducting a sound, right, conducting a band, I think about poems now. Um, I didn't think about them that way when I wrote The Chronic Worth much, but now mm-hmm. when I'm working on like a second book, I'm thinking of language and imagery and how everything has to have its place and not just kind of be exploded on the page. So that takes a little more time. That happens in phases for me. Yeah, your your next book is a book of essays. Next book is right? a book of essays, yeah. And so how's that different, how that process is for, for between essays and poetry? Um, for me, it's been kind of fluid. I think it's a fluid process because mm-hmm. I take all of the, I take the things I bring to poetry and put them in more long-form work. Mm-hmm. Um, but with essays, you know, I think the direction, my direct, my ideas have to be a little more... Um, there has to be more clarity in my approach. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't fully rely on, on metaphor and imagery. Sure. Um, but I still try to b- let some of those things bleed through. Yeah. Um, and, but the, writing an essay book was really thrilling and really fun. And, and um, I was really able to explore topics mm-hmm. at length that I hadn't been able to in a while. So well, that's exciting. I'm, I'm excited to read that. I, um, can I ask you to read one of these poems? Sure. I, um, uh, I was I was reading through these last night, and uh, this one is, um, this one particularly spoke to me. Oh yeah, yeah, cool. This poem is the first line. Like a lot of the poems uh, in the book, or some of them, the first line is the title of the poem. Mm-hmm. So, all of the black boys finally stopped packing switchblades since the summer of '98 when Danny went into the pit and got his front teeth divorced from the rest of his mouth by the fist of some white boy from the side of town where no one buries a boy that came into the world after they did, and no one ever has to swallow their own blood and pray that it will keep them fed until morning, and so Danny told us he was going to go home with someone's teeth, even if they weren't the ones he came here with, because how many things have we boys had ripped from our mouths and never replaced by anyone? How much of our language has been pulled over the tongues of everyone? one but us reparations were sought in dark alleys with a blade sharp enough to scare a jaw open and a prayer out of a sinner's mouth which explains how the white boy wept and called for his father when being pressed into the brick with danny's foot against his neck while we watched until danny finally let the boy go and we ran back out east towards our homes and maybe it was the way the rain howled or maybe where we come from we see everything drowning in red anyway or maybe there is no other way to explain the haste with which i make my pockets barren before leaving the house even today or why my wife needs a bigger purse to carry such weight for the both of us but when the police came for us that night we did not hear a sound until danny's blade fell out of his pocket and the bullets that followed because i guess anything can be a gun if the darkness surrounding it is hungry enough or at least that's what i've been told when the bodies of black boys thrash against what little life they have left tethering them to the earth and isn't that what we've always been fed that it is just like the night time to rename everything that moves into a monster wow thank you thanks oh well i tell you what i i I read this and i read it aloud to myself yeah and uh and as i suspected i i had a much different experience you know hearing it from you yeah and and that was um is very moving, and I wonder. I'm assuming these are these are narrative, like from your history. Is that is that about right? Um, some, some. So I do. Yeah, I, ha- I always have to be clear that the everything in the Chronic Worth much isn't nonfiction. It's not like a memoir, right? Right. right. Um, there are definitely aspects pulled from mm-hmm. my life. So I, I was very interested in the Kendrick Lamar album, Good Kid, Mad City, which kind of follows this. Um, 
this kids growing up, this kind of like vague idea of a kid growing mm-hmm. up in the inner city. Um, and I wanted to channel that with the crown ain't worth much. So mm-hmm. of course there are elements from my life. Some of that mm-hmm. is element ele- that some of that piece is like an element from my life. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not like all ripped from like verbatim from my life. Do you ever, do you ever think about, um, your poems maybe losing something when they're written down as opposed to when they're spoken aloud? Yeah. I mean, I think that has, that's a consideration, right? Mm -hmm. But I also think that, um, because yes, I I think of the voice as an instrument, right? So Mm -hmm. I think of the voice as a vehicle for delivering the work as it's meant to be heard and to to pull forth the emotion that is meant to be, you know, that the author intends to deliver. But I also think there's a a way to write work in a voice that's really strong or a voice that's strong enough to, to have a reader kind of step into it, even Mm -hmm. if they don't know what you sound like, even Mm -hmm. if they've never heard you speak before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always thinking about transferable imagery and transferable metaphor and transferable language. I think language at its core Mm -hmm. that that can bring people closer to what I'm trying to do. Well, because uh, there's so much emotion in in all of these. It just seems like there's such a power that's being pulled from it. And uh, I mean, and I could, I could feel it while reading it, but but just hearing it come from you, it also, <laughs> I think it did something more for me, just hearing it, um, the nuance and the, and I was picking up a lot more even just hearing you do it. So, uh, thanks for sharing that. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful poem and it's, it's powerful and it, a lot of imagery. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of your poetry, especially like this one really goes into the social, uh, justice slash injustice of, of growing up uh as a as a black kid and yeah. in, in whatever year it is i guess and and i don't know yeah i think it's important right to tell i think the only way well one of the only ways left to, to allow people to build empathy mm-hmm. is to ask them to listen to a story in which the i the person telling the story is a person who's physically in front of them, right? Mm-hmm. Or a person who they might know or who sounds like someone they might know. Mm-hmm. And so I, I speak about, uh, I think it's vital for people to speak their experiences out loud mm-hmm. and to write into their experiences and to share them in a way that, um, you know, yeah, I think it's great if people read my work and say like, well, I was really moved by this, but I'm interested in what it moves them to do. Uh Right. Or like what it's moving them towards. Yeah. Um, Because when when I hear stories from marginalized people who don't share my identity, um, if I am moved, it's that it's I'm being moved even closer to an empathy and understanding of their experiences, which makes me more likely to want to fight for their, Mm. you know, their, their, their lives, their livelihoods. It's a directional moving. Yeah. Where is it moving towards? Right. So. Um, what do you notice happening as a result? Do you hear uh, feedback from, from your readers about what it's doing for them? Yeah, I think, I mean, with the crown ain't worth much. So a lot of the crown ain't worth much was about gentrification, really Mm. about the generational impact of gentrification, um, in Columbus specifically. I mean, it's a very Columbus specific book, Mm -hmm. but I've been fortunate to hear from people in other cities and, and having them say like, this is happening here because of course it is. Right. Right. Um, and and I think when people talk about gentrification, there's a connection I'm often trying to make with gentrification and empathy, too, because I think when people think about gentrification, we often think about the idea that there was a building in a place that is no longer what it was once. Right. There was mm-hmm. a there was a housing building that is now a high rise, mm-hmm. a high rise office space. And that's fine. And that's also a part of it. And the victim of that are, is, is people. The victim is also the landscape. And I think. When a landscape changes and people who were raised there can no longer go back and show people where they come from, mm-hmm. people will lose empathy for who they are and who they become because they can't pin down. People cannot look upon a geography and say, oh, I see you came from here and you had it hard because you came from here. You lived in this neighborhood that seems like it's you know, struggling and you've, you've survived it and you're trying to do good for the people in it. If if a neighborhood changes, that people loses they lose that touch, they lose that touch ability, that like access to it, um, and I think that drains some empathy. Have you noticed anything anything like that from where you grew up? 
yeah i mean when i did i mean this is a story i tell all the time when i did press for the book i came back um the book actually said it's one year one year anniversary one year birthday yesterday yeah um, happy birthday which was great <laughs> um but when i was doing press for it i came back last summer and did like a run of local press and i took a I took a reporter to, uh, you know, a place in my own neighborhood and showed them like, oh, this used to be like a flea market. Um, and I would show them like, oh, well, this used to be like a little corner where my friends and I would bike to. And, and the corner looks different now. Mm-hmm. It has like a Jenny's, I'm sure, or mm-hmm. like, a you know, and their the reporter's response was, well, it doesn't look like you're up in a bad area. It looks like you like had it pretty nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't you know that that's not entirely accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is what the landscape reflects right now. And so it's hard to imagine oh, the the world building that's happening in the book because the world doesn't look the same. So it sounds like you grew up kind of along that Whitehall Bexley yep. area. Yeah, um, which is such a fascinating area. It's amazing. Yeah. You blink and you're in a different yep. ecosystem. Absolutely. It's amazing. It's it's one of the, I think it's one, and I know that I'm partial to this because it's where I'm from, but I think it's one of the oddest parts of Columbus because you're right, you, from block to block, it's a different, and with, not only from block to block is it a different ecosystem, but like, the, they don't reflect each other at all. That's right. And, and the people inside of them tend to want no parts of the other people, yeah. like in, you know, um, and it's just kind of like a, it's not just one bubble, it's like 10 to 15 little bubbles Mm -hmm. block by block. And you can see how much the cities in the city or suburbs or whatever value those ecosystems by just how they like, just the looking at them. Right. Um, You know, you go down you drive down main street and it's like, if you start, if you started like the main library or you started like, you know, where the main around where the main library is and just go straight down main, you know, you're going to see like 12 different neighborhoods. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's not a far drive, no. so it's yeah, it's fascinating. Right? It reminds me a little of when you're when you're tra- traveling uh, interstate and you yeah. cross a state line, and and all of a sudden the 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 the, the road is perfectly paved and looks really great. Yep. <laughs> and the road you just came off of is full of potholes, gravel, and needs yeah. work. <laughs> and I mean that's it's you know, almost as as vast a difference. It's fascinating. It's yeah. I mean that's 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 the area I grew up in, so that created a lot of like interesting yeah there's a there's a, a line in one of your poems um the i think it's uh uh white boys on the east side oh, love larry, larry bird, bird. Yeah, yeah. how you you guys would play the you would go and 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 find you know the white kids to to beat at basketball yeah. so you could get their money so yeah. you could have something to eat that play day. for money yeah yeah <laughs> and it's in in and you know i think and i came from a neighborhood that was at least at the time known for just like great basketball players yeah. um but if you biked a little bit like you know biked a little bit west and you got to play in the bexley parks there would be significantly less good players right yeah um or players who like never crossed over that border to yeah. come to like scott wood park or come to johnson park and play with uh-huh. the kids in my neighborhood and yeah we would uh, my friends and i um would you know shoot shoot baskets for money it was just kind of because we knew we would Yeah. Win. And that was such a great image to for the finger pointing oh, yeah, you know, yeah. to the sky, just this undeserving finger yeah. soaking up the sun or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. There's a um one line that stuck out to me and I wrote it down. It said, uh where I'm from, none of the black boys celebrate until the ball slides through the net, falling satisfied from its mouth. Yeah. That sounds like a philosophy of life to me. I think it's a good philosophy. I think everyone should follow it. Yeah. Perhaps. I think <laughs> It's like literally, it's pretty much just saying don't couch your chickens before they hatch, just like in a more updated version of that. Yeah, it is. They don't celebrate till the ball slides through the net. Yeah. So, so coming back after being away for, for a couple of years, what, what's one of the, I mean, you obviously love this city. It's, uh, you've been all over it. You've lived in different parts of it and yeah. uh, you've experienced it. What is some of the biggest needs that you see now, you know, for the city? Oh, God. I mean, it. So I feel like perhaps I'm not the person to speak on this because I've been gone for so long, but I do think there needs to be work, um, uh, you know, police accountability nationwide, of course. But Mm -hmm. I do think that people in Columbus, uh, it seems, don't believe that's a thing that's needed here, but I think it's needed here more than a lot of places, right? So I think, um, you know, really holding police accountable in Columbus is vital. 
more than that to, or, or also in tandem with that, I think that, um, neighborhoods need to, to stay intact. You know, people need to have places where they can live and raise their families and not worry about a city chewing through their, their home to build something else. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, and I think about that not only on the East side, of course, I'm partial to it on the East side because that's where I'm from, but also on the West side, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Franklin 10 and, and these areas, you know, like that is also a concern there. Mm-hmm. Um, I worry about marginalized people being pushed further to the margins. And I think that, um, and it's, I mean, it's fair saying that like poverty looks different on the East side than it does on the West side. And I think, I mean, the demographics of, of that poverty are different, right? There's mm-hmm. more working white, poor people on the West side, um, who are also suffering, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, there are more working poor black people or people of color on the east side. But I, I think um, the, there's those both on on both of those spectrums. They're still fighting against the same machinery that's trying to push them further and further away from perhaps where they were children and now raising their children. I think that's vital. Mm-hmm. I think allowing people a, a, a consistent neighborhood is really vital. Um, how do you do that? So, I mean, I don't have answers for how to, like, work through urban development in a way that is yeah. not. Um, but I think there has to be a way to um, work with communities in tandem, mm-hmm. right, to um, create housing and working opportunities without pricing out people who live there. Um, because at least what happens on the east side with Bexley um, – is that Bexley is just like, well, you know, sure, we have a supermarket here, but like, let's just build another one. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that, and that's not serving anyone. Right. It's, it's serving this idea of making their bubble more rigid. Right. So Bexley has that Kroger. There's a Kroger on the corner of, I think, like Leonard in Maine. Mm-hmm. Um, and that Kroger's fine. Mm-hmm. Kroger's been there forever. When I was at Capitol, that Kroger was their grocery store. Right. But people from Bexley were like, oh, it's a little bit. It's like a block outside of our comfort zone. Mm. So now they have that giant eagle market district or whatever, which is like, didn't need that. Mm-hmm. You have a whole grocery store right there, like a right. block away. Right. Um, but it, it feeds this bubble mentality. It feeds the mm-hmm. idea of keeping people, you know, that whole thing where you blink and you're in another neighborhood. It keeps that, that Bexley block very, very mm-hmm. comfortable and safe for people. The idea of safety. Um, and so I, I think it's, you know, I'm not a city planner. Mm-hmm. Um, but I imagine there has to be a way to, to listen to the needs of the people who live, um, listen to the needs of the marginalized folks who like live in these areas and, and want to continue living in these areas and want to raise families in these areas. Um, you know, I'm kind of fortunate in that my, the, the neighborhood where, um, I spent my, like the second half of my childhood, um, is kind of, largely untouched now Mm -hmm. you know my dad still lives there Mm -hmm. a lot of the people who lived there when i was young still live there um it's in a kind of a it's in a place that's not of a lot of value to the city Mm -hmm. uh, as far as like if you can't really build on top of it because it's kind of you know you can build around you can build around those surrounding streets like it's right off livingston which is you know you can build on livingston and all that but the actual street itself uh, a lot of those people are still intact and you know those houses are still intact. So that's a real blessing. And I'm wondering um, what the secret to that is and why that isn't happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So you say your dad lives over, still lives over on the East side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Right off Livingston. And that's where I, I mean, we, um, that is where my family moved. I think when I was around 12, Uh 11 or 12. Um, And that's kind of where I spent the second half of my childhood. And, and, um, and that is where the first time I felt like I was in an actual like neighborhood. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, a neighborhood that I can go back to today and it still feels like there, you know, I have growing up, I had friends who lived on that block and, um, they're not, of course their families aren't all still there, but I, a couple of their families, I could still drive down the block and see like yeah. you know, the mom of one of the friends I had when I was a kid, you nice. know, and that's kind of cool. Hmm. Are you, uh, are- how many, you said there were four four kids. Yes, yeah, so I have three siblings. Uh-huh. Only one lives in Columbus. Okay. Um, my brother lives in Indianapolis. My sister lives in Maine. Okay. Um, and so we're kind of scattered. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that, like, I, um, 
you know, largely I was con- content with the idea when I left here, mm-hmm. when I moved, I was kind of content with the idea that I wasn't going to come back. I was, I thought yeah. this was like it for me and I was sad and yeah. all those things. But I, I think coming back has been a real, both, um, surprise and in, in, in a lot of ways, um, but a real fortunate thing for me. Yeah. It's a good well, deal. we're glad to have you back. We need, we need more, uh, um, socially minded, active, yeah, creatives around here. <laughs> yeah, and I'm thrilled with kind of the. I think there's a lot of like great young activists in the city who are doing great work, and mm-hmm. I um, am really thrilled with that. I'm amazed at the amount of action yeah. that, that is happening constantly. I'm always getting invitations to, you know, either a, a, a protest or a, or a meeting or yeah. a gathering or a town hall or something. There's always something happening, and it's. It's exciting to see people so involved and, and excited about yeah. and seeing I mean, things happen. Organizing is hard work. So, mm-hmm. that, I mean, organizing is viciously hard work mm-hmm. and often really thankless work. Mm-hmm. And so to have people who are committed to that is like half the battle. Yeah. You know, I mean, have people who are like willing to do that and not, you know, into, I mean, it, you burn out on it quickly. Yeah. And so to have a community of people really uplifting each other in that work is beautiful to see. Wow. So do you have anything uh, have anything new that you'd like to oh, sure. share? Yeah, I have to find it. I I'll have to like read it uh, off off my phone. If oh, that's, that's okay. Cool. No, that's fine. You um, don't have it. You don't have everything memorized. No, <laughs> I wish. I'm I'm a little. I'm too old for that now. Perhaps. <laughs> um, let's see. I'll, I'll read a thing about uh, Michael Jordan. Okay. Um, kind of about Michael Jordan. I was at, I was teaching at Kenyon College for the past two weeks, or well, a couple weeks ago, I was there for two weeks, um, and I was teaching their Young Writers Workshop, which was really great. So yeah. you teach, like, these, like, brilliant, it's pretty selective, so you get, like, 110 teenagers who are um, all about to be either juniors or seniors, so 16 or 17 mm-hmm. year olds, and they're all just brilliant. I mean, I love writing, and you work with them for two weeks, and you are encouraged to write with them. Um you know, as you're teaching, you write with them. Um, and there was a prompt about a writing prompt about using, um, something that you grew up with and saw on television mm-hmm. as an entry point for a poem. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course for me, that was like, well, you know, I'm like over a decade older than you guys. So it's, you know, yours is going to be something vastly different. Mm-hmm. But I thought about Michael Jordan. I thought about the, um, NBA finals in, in the year he, he hit the game winning shot in the, in the finals and pushed off to do it. Mm. So here's a poem that again, the first line is the title. It is maybe time to admit that Michael Jordan definitely pushed off that one time in the 98 NBA finals and in praise of one man's hand on the waist of another's and in praise of the ways we guide our ships to the shore of some brief and gilded mercy. I touch my fingers to the hips of this vast and immovable grief and push once more. And who is to say really how much weight was behind Jordan's palm on that night in Utah and on that same night, One year earlier, the paramedics pulled my drowning mother from the sheets where she slept, and they said it must have felt like a whole hand was pushing down on her lungs, and I spent the whole summer holding my breath in bed until the small black spots danced on the ceiling, and I am sorry that there is no way to describe this that is not about agony, or that is not about someone being torn from the perch of their comfort, and on the same night a year before my mother died, Jordan wept on the floor of the United Center locker room after winning another title because it was Father's Day and his father went to sleep on the side of a road in 93 and woke up a ghost and there is no moment worth falling to our knees and galloping towards like the one that sings our dead into the architecture and so yes for a moment in 1998 Michael Jordan made what space he could on the path between him and his father's small and breathing grace and so yes reader there is an ocean between us the length of my arm and I have built nothing for you that can survive it and from here I am close enough to be seen but not close enough to be cherished and from here reader I can see every possible ending before we even touch yeah 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 very very evocative thank you yeah and very personal yeah I think you know weirdly um I think a lot of people think of the crown ain't worth much as personal Mm mm-hmm 
And I guess it is in some ways, but because like I am not the character in the book, and I and I think that's because people think that the the main character in the book is me because there are some elements of a lot of elements of my life in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had some distance from that because I knew that I was not, you know, yes, I was pulling a lot out of my life to build this character, mm-hmm. but you know, what I was not the main character. So I think in a lot of my newer work. Um, you know, it feels more personal to me because I am the character. Like I am the person in the work. Mm. Cool. Is that, is that going to be in the new book? Uh, perhaps I don't, you know, I wrote it a couple of weeks ago, so oh, okay. gotta, <laughs> I think I have to figure out what it, what kind of life it's going to live, but sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, gosh, thanks so much. What? So uh, one more, I want to, sure. I'm just interested in like, um, like who you are reading and who people should, should check out that they may not know yeah so i'm reading uh poetry wise um i just got a book a new book by adrian matika who's a poet i love he lives in uh indiana uh his book is called map to the stars and i really love it um i just revisited uh, a book called bestiary by donica kelly who is a poet i love a lot Mm -hmm. a tiny chat book that came out um just this week from a poet named Eloisa Amiscua that mm-hmm. I love. It's called Mexica Americana. Um, those have been my big three recent ones. In like long form writing, I'm always reading Lester Bang's music criticism because I love him. Mm-hmm. I'm always reading Jessica Hopper's music criticism because I, I love her and value her voice. And um, and I and I think that I, I'm trying to get back into like um, reading novels for just for pleasure. But that's been a hard road for me. So I'm always Mm -hmm. up for if people are listening to this and see me on the street, they can yell novel suggestions at me. Okay. (laughs) Awesome. Well, Hanif, thank you so much. This has been great. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad you're back. (laughs) Thanks, Dan. It's good to be back. All right. Thanks. I really, really like that guy. Love talking with him. I feel like I've just scratched the surface, though. And maybe when the new book comes out, we can do a follow-up. You can keep up with Hanif and find out where he is and what he's doing on Twitter at Nif Muhammad and his webpage at abdurakeeb.com. I'll have all that information available on this episode's description page, either on the podcast tab on my webpage, danheight.com, or on whatever podcast app you're using. Please make sure to subscribe and share with your friends and leave me a review if you don't mind. It does help. That's it. And as always, thanks so much for listening. And let's go make some stories.